then then started my own outsourced CFO consulting firm, uh, pretty much because people kept asking me for free financial advice. And I was like, I'm done giving <laughs> all this free work. You know, the saying, if you're good at something, don't do it for free. Yeah. Um, and that that's really where, where, where my consulting firm was born. It was called Fidico. And right after Fidico, uh, I Clockwork was born because I needed a solution. I needed something to get me out of financial modeling and Excel and scenario planning and all that kind of stuff. And, and you know, every tool in the market was abysmal. And so I figured I'd do it myself. By the way, it's, it's, it, it's oh, sorry, go ahead, Michael. I was going to say Fidico, is that, is that something you can order at? Or Jordanian restaurant. <laughs> it sounds like a delicious, a delicious dish with tzatziki sauce and. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's hard. It must be really hard when you're the black sheep, but you went to Stanford. Everyone's like, oh, yeah. oh, geez, look, he's only going to Stanford, you know. So <laughs> I was like, well, it's a, that's a tough crowd. That's a so that's crazy. So you went. So were you in Amman, Jordan? Is that right, or just Jordan? Yeah. We'll just say Jordan. You come to St. Louis. How old were you? I was two, a little over two years old. Okay, so so let's talk talk about St. Louis because I was reading about sort of you know the arch grant you got and things like that. How, what does St. Louis sort of hold hold a, like a special place in your heart, or you know is that home to you, or do you just like still? You know, is, is you are you culturally still sort of feel like you're Jordanian? I'm a hundred percent Jordanian. I I very rarely talk about uh, St. Louis in any. For me, if I'm going to say my home is Chicago, like okay. as a city, Chicago is the only city, and has been the only city that I felt at home when I'm there. Right, the okay. energy, the vibe, the people. Growing up in St. Louis was really, really challenging. I honestly, the only tie I have to St. Louis, even though St. Louis is technically home, all my family's here. Um, If it wasn't for my family, I would literally never come back to St. Louis uh, a day, you know, (laughs) unpopular opinion. I'm sure that people, you know, but St. Louis just was not, um, it's a great city to live if you're, you know, married, kids, great, great city to raise a family, but for an entrepreneur, someone who's tech focused, um, innovative, VC backed, it's just not the city. Um, and Chicago is the Chicago. When I moved to Chicago, it was it was like holy! Sh- I'm finally with my kinds mm-hmm. of people. Um, well, I that's never a big felt difference. That. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. St. Louis to Chicago is what? What are the, what's probably like the top two three differences, Fady, between the two places? One of the biggest differences when you tell people that you're a tech entrepreneur in Chicago, they're like, oh, that's awesome. I have this idea. I'm doing this or my friend is doing this. And how can I help you? And let me introduce you to da 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 If you do that in St. Louis, people are like, wait, you're what? So you work at Worldwide Technology? No, I don't work. At, you know, I'm a tech, I run a tech company. And then they're like, okay, but like, do you have investors? I'm like, yeah, I have, we're VC backed out of Boston. They're like, but you belong in Boston. Why are you? And I'm like, oh my gosh, like I can't even have an innovative <laughs> conversation with, um, you know, in St. Louis, if you're not in healthcare or in education, you, it, you're, you're kind of out of. We're making barbecue. <laughs> yeah. 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 You're, or, kind, or, you're kind of out of the status yeah. quo. Yeah. Or Nelly. Or barbecue, Nelly, yeah. barbecue, Nelly, healthcare. Okay. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, yeah. so first, now really quick, I just want to get into the restaurants real fast because yeah. I helped a I helped a friend and Michael did too, sort of you know, open a restaurant, which was a wild experience. What kind of restaurants were they? I looked up one, looks like one sort of a cafeteria style. Yeah, you said it was multiple, which I didn't know. So yeah, well, multiple locations. Okay, of the, of the re- so my dad actually bought the restaurants. So he bought them from another individual. We were the third owners of the restaurants. And this is kind of the the story that you don't see on our website or on on any kind of socials is my dad was educated in the States. He went to University of Florida, got his master's in civil engineering, but no company would sponsor him because he didn't have his green card yet. He wasn't a U.S. citizen. So no company would sponsor him. And so he had three young kids. My little sister was, was... born in in you know 1990 you know and 
my dad was like, okay, I have a wife and three kids. I need to provide for my family. And coming, they, they actually owned a bunch of clothing stores in Jordan, my dad and his, his brothers and his, his dad. So he's used to running their, his own shop. And he was like, well, how different could a restaurant be? And so they literally found this restaurant for sale and he bought it and, you know, took out a massive loan at the age of, you know, 30, 32, and was like, I'll just run this for a couple of years until I get my sponsorship or citizenship. Mm -hmm. And then I'll go and work what I studied for. And, you know, a couple of years in, he was like, I can't turn down the opportunity that we have right now. And so what was supposed to be a two to three year little stint turned into running the restaurant for 23 years wow. because of the life wow. that he built uh, for us. So, you know, my dad literally sacrificed his life to give us something that he never had and that my mom never had uh, growing up. That's wild. Now is, uh, this is maybe a dumb question. Although someone once told me there's no dumb question, just dumb people asking the question. <laughs> um, is, uh, what, what's the Jordanian sort of immigrant situation in St. Louis? Is there a large population or was St. Louis just sort of like, let's get to St. Let's get to the loo and we'll figure it out. Yeah. St. Louis was not the choice actually. So my, my, our, the oldest son of the, you know, the, He's kind of now he's kind of like the godfather of the family, but it's my mom's <laughs> oldest brother. So both my both okay. my parents are the babies of their family. Um, so my mom's oldest brother, he's a uro urologist, and he studied medical school in Italy. And they kind of put all their eggs in his basket. They're like, great, if you become a doctor, you'll make it out of this tiny little broke house in Jordan. Mm -hmm. And he literally went to medical school. They put every dollar that they had in supporting him. He went from Italy medical school and he was actually going to be in Chicago. So he, his initial residency was placed in Chicago and he, you know, basically the, the person that was running the organization was extremely racist. And, you know, he, no would, he kind of, he kind of had it out with my uncle. My uncle was like, dude, you don't know what you're doing. You're dangerous. You're not, you're not doing a good job. And so he had it out with him and it just so happened because St. Louis and Chicago are so close to each other. He was connected to someone in St. Louis and he came down here, met with the person and then bam, that's how St. Louis happened. And then he brought his mom from Jordan to St. Louis. And my mom is you know the baby of the family so she's attached to her mom's hip and so she asked my dad if we could just they could just come to st louis um and we you know the funny thing is, is my parents didn't even intend to move to st louis um the only reason we stayed in st louis is because we were actually on summer vacation in summer of 1990 and that was the summer that saddam hussein invaded kuwait whoa and my dad was in the Jordanian army because every, every man has to be in the army in Jordan, just like Israel. And, you know, because of, because he studied in the U S all the paperwork was already started for him to stay in the U S the green card and all that kind of stuff. My mom, you know, was, was, was on that stuff from the get go. And basically all his family were like, if you come back, they're going to reactivate you into the, into the Jordanian army. And you're going to go half, you're going to go half to literally stand on the border to make yeah. sure that nothing happens in Jordan. He was like, I don't want to do that. And so they're like, okay, just wait it out in St. Louis and wait it out. You know, that, that war turned into a lot, lot yeah. larger of a situation. And so that's literally why we stayed in the U S yeah. Well, that's, that's crazy. That's, that's super, crazy. And it's weird that there's no doctors from that part of the world. So I can understand why <laughs> that doctor in Chicago would take that, you know, that is so wild. Um, yeah. So really quick before we get into clockwork, I'm really curious. Whenever people are from like a family of restaurateurs or restaurant owners, I always wonder. So I'm my family owned furniture businesses and they mm -hmm. would always say, we do not want you to take it over. Yeah. It was sort of <laughs> one of those things where it's like this sort of seems cool, but it is yeah. wild and it's hard. Um, did you ever want to be in the restaurant business? Like even as a kid and were your parents like, you're not you're going to Stanford dude you're getting out of here what what was that like <laughs> from day one my dad every single day and my my both my dad and my mom were like you are none of you are taking over the restaurant 
none of you, even though we, I literally, I didn't have summer breaks. My summer breaks were working in the restaurant. Yeah. Yeah. You know, even as a kid, I was literally working there. I always say as, as for as long as I was tall enough to reach over the counter, I was working there <laughs> and, you know, that was my summer break. And, and, you know, we, and what kind I of restaurant worked, was it? Uh, it was called Garavelli's. Garavelli's. Garavelli's restaurant. So the, it was actually the, the year that my dad sold it was the hundredth year of the, of the restaurant being open. Wow. So it's when you Garavelli's, talk, what did it serve? So it was cafeteria, like good old yeah. American food, like roast <laughs> beef, ham. Like I'm up there behind the line, carving the meats. <laughs> little little fatty with a big knife. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The 10 year old slice of yeah. prime rib. Yeah. yeah. That's, exa- that wow. that's exactly it. I mean, but my parents were adamant. None of us were, none of us, they, they didn't want that life for us. Oh. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't want it either. I mean, my dad worked from 10 a.m. till 9 p.m., Monday through Sunday, mm-hmm. seven days a week, 360 days out of the year. Like, no break. The only breaks he would have is when I was old enough. My excitement was turning 16 to get my driver license so I can drive myself to the restaurant and give my dad a day off. Like, that's what I was excited about wow. when I, to, get, to get my driver license. I feel, I feel like this, this, your story is, is a snapshot of like 90% of the immigrant kid and, you know, near immigrant kid story of just hard work and restaurant work and all those, all that stuff that, uh, and all, and all of our parents are, you know, most of them come highly skilled, you know, super skilled in their country and they come and have to humble themselves in this very basic what we would what we and, and even americans would consider menial jobs oh, yeah. Yeah. and menial businesses and yet it is what it's what climbs a, a whole generation in one generation yeah. to stanford right or to college education or to upper middle class or to just yeah. the wealth stat the wealth bracket in one generation changes dramatically yeah. but it starts there so that's just uh, incredible but it it, it you know, the reason why I connected with you so easy is just because I was like, okay, yeah, his, I can tell his background. Yeah. The story is the same story. It's yeah. just the same <laughs> yeah. story yeah. of having yeah. to grind out a whole generation to get to yeah. where you are today. Yeah. It's, awesome. yeah. it's, it's, it's important to tell it too, because I yeah. feel like everyone feels like, you know, the immigrant word right now is this thing where it's like, well, everyone's coming from the South and, you know, and, and there it's unskilled labor and it's this and it's that, that's not what, what this is. And, right. you know, it's grinders. And it, it reminds me of the episode of the office where Michael's working in the call center with the <laughs> Indian guy. Have you seen that? And, yeah, the Indian guy and the guys, it. yeah. And he's like, what do you, do? what did you do in India? He's like, well, I was a doctor. And Michael's yeah. like, I think I would have been a doctor in India too. Yeah. It's like, no, you, you know, it's like, that's, but yeah. that is, I think that's a very American sort of way of looking at it. Like, oh yeah, well, I guess I probably would have been that too, but that's not it. I mean, you guys, yeah. you hit reset yeah. and you come here and you climb the ladder. So I, I think also, that that's important. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, I think you're spot on. And, and the thing is, you know, people always like to say, oh, the immigrant story. And I, for me, I always hate, they're like, oh, you, you live, your parents are the American dream. It's like, no, no, no we are, we're, we, we, we're just doing what we're supposed to do. Yeah, exactly. Right? Like this isn't an American, it's not American versus not American. Right. I would never consider myself as not American, even though I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a dual citizen. I'm Jordanian. When anyone asks me like, um, being American means you just have more access to more <laughs> opportunities. That's what being American is. And, and you have the freedom to pursue them through hard work. And that's what immigrants take, take, take advantage of. And it's, it's because we know the other side. When you don't have opportunity, when you get shit on for being Christian in a Muslim country, mm-hmm. when you get shit on for being brown in a white city, when yeah. you get shit on for all these like that's why for us we're like wait i can start my own company and go raise two and a half million dollars simply from hard work game on let's go yeah let's let's let's, let's do it because we know the other side well that's a perfect sort of lead into what i think is i want to talk about next is so you know we have a little bit of that entrepreneurial spirit 
from your dad, who's like, hey, we'll open a restaurant. So what drove you to be an entrepreneur? Was there, was there something that made you think like, were you at Stanford when it happened? Or was it before were you in high school when you're like, hey, listen, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to start my own business. Or was it something that happened later? I was in eighth grade. Um, I was in eighth grade. I took my first, because like I said, my entire family was pushing me to be a doctor. My older brother's a doctor. He's married to a doctor. My cousins are all doctors. Everyone was like, you are going to be a doctor. I was like, I really don't want to be a doctor. And, and one of the wildest things is my uncle, who's the urology, uh, urological surgeon. He runs his own private practice. When I was in like sixth or seventh grade, he literally wrote, he, you know, he, he's like I said, he's like the godfather. He kind of acts like the godfather too. And he literally wrote me a million dollar check and he wrote it in my name. And he goes, when you graduate uh, residency, when you leave residency, here's your signing bonus to come and work oh. for me at the, wow. at the office. Wow. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And then I was like, and then I took an accounting and finance class in eighth grade. And we had a, we had an, an exercise oh. where you ran a fake stock portfolio. Yeah, I, I did that. Yeah. Yeah. And I killed it. And I was like, wait, <laughs> I can make money by other, by betting on other people's successes and their companies. And I can, I was like, wait, what is this? That, that clipped it for me where I was like, I want to go into uh, finance. And I was like, I want to work for myself because I have negative patience. Like, you can, you know, people always talk about patience and patience. And as an entrepreneur, you have to have patience. I am the direct opposite. I have no patience. So I can't dedicate 50 years at a company just to be a director, right? Like when I started at Boeing, the only reason I started at Boeing really was, you know, I was like, I don't know what else to do. You know, I, I don't know enough to start my own company. So I need some real skills, but eventually I want to start my own company. Um, and it's, it's always been that input versus output. If I'm going to, if I can control my output with how much I put in, I'm, yeah. I'm taking that, that all day hands down. And that's, that's really what entrepreneurship was to me. I love, you have a quote on your Twitter and I was looking it up. It says, being aggressively patient is the key to growth. You have to be hungry enough to find what's worth being patient for when you're building your company. Which, you know, I love the aggressively patient, you know, yeah. sort of that hybrid of so, okay, so that is, that's a wild story that you were essentially offered a million dollar bonus <laughs> at, before you were in ninth grade and you, and then you took a finance class, which to me is like, would have cemented you like, yeah, I'll take that. Yeah. I'll, take that I'll be a, I'll be a millionaire. <laughs> uh, but instead you're like, you know what? I'm not waiting for that. So yeah. let's get a little bit into, so, so you go to Stanford, which I think is that's, I mean, to me, I'm a Notre Dame fan. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll admit to you, right. And I went to ASU, but I'll admit to you, to me, there's Stanford has serious cachet. Yeah. So, and I hear unbelievable stories about the way they foster everything for their students at Stanford. Tell me a little bit about, you know, what did Stanford do to that vision about being an entrepreneur mm -hmm. Who were you around? Like, did it foster it or was any part of it? Did you, I mean, I'm sure you had crazy guest speakers that came in that they were entrepreneurs. And you're like, well, I don't know if I can do what that guy did or did well, that fire you up? Yeah, I, I've never, I've never come across any speaker where I'm like, I can't do that. Or mm -hmm. they did something that I can't do. I, and, you know, call it ego, call it whatever. I, I don't care. Every single thing that I see, every single success, I'm like, I can do that and I will do that. I, it's just, I'm going to do a different path. Um, you know, my Stanford, I was, I was there thankfully through Boeing, right. I, that was where I got my, got my, you know, post-grad, my undergrad was done at St. Louis university. Right. I, and the only reason I did that was St. Louis university gave me the most money and it allowed me to graduate in three years. They took a lot of my college credit. So I graduated with a double major in three years from SLU and and they make the ncaa tournament every once in a while right yeah every once and in a while yeah. kind of <laughs> that's why. story yeah um but stanford was was a phenomenal program that i got to be involved in strictly because of how aggressive i was at boeing oh. and awesome. so i was i was constantly pushing like crazy at boeing i'm like this is not enough for me this is not enough for me this is not enough for me this is not and and you know literally to go to 
to, to be in the program that I was in, you had to get executive VP sign off. And we're not talking like, you know, low level executive, we're talking executive VP of Boeing, right? Yeah, so, Boeing, not like, yeah. not, you know, Kate's and Associates. Yeah. Where it could so, be anyone, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it was, it was a phenomenal opportunity and the people that you meet at Stanford, I mean, I felt like an idiot in the room and I was like, this is how I know that I'm in the right place because I felt dumb. Yeah. And that's the only way you get better. Ted, just for a second, encourage people. I think that's something, you know, as, especially as Americans, we get in a room like that and we sort of want to flee. Yeah. Right. Your instinct was like, perfect. This is where I need to be. So if, if someone's listening right now who feels like that, maybe they're in the company where they feel dumb, like maybe it's me or, you know, someone else, you know, what's your encouragement? Hey, stick it out. This is good. It feels hard, but, but, to, you know, and give them some encouragement about that. Yeah. I mean, if you're not uncomfortable in the situation you're in, you're in the wrong situation. Yeah. I mean, there, there is not, even with clockwork, like I purposely put myself in uncomfortable situations because I know no one's going to do it for me. Right. When you're the yeah. CEO, you have to do it. And then you have to replicate that for all of your team members and all of the people that you work with and put them in uncomfortable situations and yeah. see if they can rise uh, to, to, you know, rise to the, to the event. Like, can you, can you elevate your skill set? Because if you are comfortable, you are going to get bored. You are never going to reach your potential. And for me, I, you know, like that quote says, right, aggressively patient, you have to be aggressively patient with yourself and if you are not growing you are dying like that's yeah. that's it and the only way to grow is to be uncomfortable yeah I, I, I was telling my leadership team today that you'll remember some of the you know great fun happy times that you had in your business but you'll remember more mm -hmm. the really mm -hmm. bad times oh yeah. yeah and you'll remember who was there yeah, how you got through it, how you felt, it'll be so visceral to you, and that's, and, and and you'll learn the most, and you'll remember it, and frankly, you'll go back like, wow, I got through that. Yeah, and and I think you also realize, and you've been through the seasons like this where you're like, wait, I still have food on the table, I yeah. still have my family, I still have friends, yeah, yeah. I'm not starving, yeah. um, I still have a bed to sleep in okay, it's actually not that bad. Like, yeah. like this yeah. situation I thought that was going to be bad or felt terrible, it's actually not that bad. Like, yeah. what people scared you to say, oh, never yeah. get yourself in that situation. You're like, oh, yeah. it's actually not as bad as people say it is. Yeah. And, yeah, you, do you want to purposely be in all those things? No. But would you volunteer to be there? No. Oh, but sure. you will remember, you will remember more of those moments than – Oh yeah, it was every year was amazing or yeah. every everything was a victory and nothing was hard, yeah. right? And it puts things into perspective. I mean, yeah. it puts I, you know, I went from living super comfortably, you know, I was the CFO of a of a, you know, seed stage we would raise a series A, making, you know, 150, 175,000 a year and I was I was driving a, you know, $90,000 car, living in a ridiculous condo. I lived check, 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 right? All be it before the age of 30. And it still wasn't good enough for me. You know, I, when I say I'm a psycho, I mean, I'm a psycho. Like usually people be like, <laughs> I'm, I'm chilling. I'm not going to change. I, no, I, I, I wanted to keep pushing. And so I went from living that super comfortable life to being broke because I put every dollar into clockwork. I went from just balling to being broke. And being broke taught me so much. Like there's a reason why now clockwork, I've only had to raise two and a half million dollars to get to the growth that we're at, where other companies have to raise 10 plus million to do what, what we've done with literally $2 million. Um, Just remind me of that Lecrae song, being broke made me rich. Yes, <laughs> being yes, broke made me rich. <laughs> that's, exa that's exactly it. And, and another awesome. important thing you said is you remember who was there for you. Yeah. Right. You know, like, and, you know, to, to add on to that phenomenal reference, you know, where were you when I was shooting in the gym, you know, like from Drake, you know, like yeah. Rick Ross, like where, who was there when you had nothing mm -hmm. and 
how are they supporting you? Because it's easy to be surrounded by, by people that are naysayers. No, you can't do this. No, you can't do this. That's not possible. You're an idiot. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. I was surrounded by all of them. When I left Boeing, people are like, you are such an idiot. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. I'm like, listen, I'm making 70 grand a year. I, I don't give a shit. I, you know, <laughs> I need to go and make more. I need to. And I was so driven by that output. Um, but going through the tough challenges really, really help you put everything into perspective, personal, professional, family, friends, the whole nine. Yeah. And I think, you know, this, I mean, now this, I'm not giving a war analogy, but I just finished watching band of brothers. Yeah. And what to it, man, I mean, those guys who went through crazy experiences in Gaston and places like that all basically said, you know, there's some funny things you remember, but it's really the torture, yeah. not the physical torture, but oh, it is physical torture, but it's, it's the hard things. And I think too, now I don't have like, you know, I have some entrepreneurial background, but I, this is not a joke. We used to go to these crazy football camps that are illegal now where it was a, they, we called them character building camps, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. to this day, I am terrified. I went, this is probably five years ago. I was at Outback, you know, spit on a million dollar check guy. Okay. I was at Outback Steakhouse with my <laughs> wife. I saw the coach from that camp. I got scared. Oh my you know? God. But what's funny, yeah. I started texting my friends and they were like, yeah, dude, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's, you're right. You know, who are you surrounded with? And yeah. like, who's in your foxhole? You know, who yeah. are you sticking in that foxhole with yourself, who's going to be there. So, you know, and I think that we're sort of, it's a lot of people now who are not willing to climb into the foxhole. They're just sort of, you know, Hey, listen, we talked about this a little bit before we went on the air, but you know, I'll just get, we'll get comfortable sort of like you just yeah. talked about, you know, I'll be, I'll be fine doing that. And there's people who are like, let's go man. Front lines. Well, let's, people don't understand what it means. Mm -hmm. And I think that was one of the biggest things with clockwork and quite honestly, I didn't understand what it meant, right? I had never run a VC-backed tech company, right? I was the CFO of a company that was VC-backed, but I was never, it, was, it wasn't my company. I wasn't a founder. I was one of the, I was the employee number four, but I wasn't, I wasn't responsible at the end of the day for the whole business. Yeah. And when I got into it, one of my biggest lessons learned, people think that they want to join a startup until they join a startup. <laughs> totally, totally. Right? <laughs> they join and they're like, holy shit, I have to do marketing and sales and support. And I have to respond to this customer service ticket at three in the morning. And I have to respond to the developers at six in the morning. I have to, it's like, yes, you have to do all of that. And there's yeah, a lot of, I don't care like, what your title is. Yeah. Nothing's yeah. nothing's you're not too good for any of it. No. Yeah. Yeah. Until yeah. you're at like 50 employees, <laughs> you guess what? You're doing everything. Yeah. Like, I yeah. don't give a shit especially at a, especially at a VC backed tech startup, like people, that was my, one of my biggest learnings. like last year was an extremely challenging year for me. It was clockwork, you know, five X clockwork killed it last year. We did, we did really well. We've continued to grow really well, but it was miserable for me also because I looked and I, you know, the people that were around weren't understanding all the things that I was having to carry forward. That was a huge challenge. Um, and one of the biggest learnings is that I'll never, I'll never make that mistake again is if you are not, if I, if I don't know a thousand percent that you're going to have my back at the end of the day, and I can trust you tenfold when things get tough, that's, that's an easy, easy, non-negotiable. Um, like pushing a Ford Taurus through a neighborhood, right? A hundred percent. No exactly. one's not there with the, yeah. For sure. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, I think it was really important. I, that sort of went off what I wanted to talk about, but I think that sort of your answer there and what Michael was saying, um, you know, and I think to, to speak to someone, if you're looking at working for a startup, what they said is correct, but I can tell you, I came to work for a startup with Michael. And the other thing that it does allow you to is Michael. And I think most startups are like this. Hey, if you make a mistake, it's okay. Yeah. admit it mm -hmm. let's go you know yeah. there's not like a hey but we're going to put you on corrective action for the next six months yeah. uh, to make sure that <laughs> yeah. you know you don't send out a, uh, an unspelled checked email again yeah. um so you know that's really important so 
we talked about this earlier, but I want to talk about it again, just so everyone can hear it. So, you know, I was in the insurance industry. You have an elevator speech. What do you do for a living? What do you have? You talked about when you, when you were in St. Louis and you would say what you were going to do, people in St. Louis were, their mind was blown by it. And they, they sort of were like, I don't know what you're doing. You're crazy. So when, so you're in Chicago now, so when someone, when you meet somebody, they say, hey, what do you do for a living? Give me like a two minute synopsis. And just for even for people listening who are thinking, OK, Fady, what do you do? What is clockwork? I just, you know, give me two minutes, you know, two to five and tell me what clockwork is, what it does. So I, all I say is I run a tech company that's essentially an AI powered digital CFO for growing companies. Mm-hmm. It integrates with. QuickBooks Online and Zero, and it gives businesses and their accountants CFO level insights in a matter of minutes. Um, and do this for me too. So I'm, I mean, now I'm working in this industry for people who aren't, because I know I have people right now who are like agency managers of insurance companies. Tell them, like, we know what the term CFO is. What is a CFO resp- like? It's at Boeing. What's a CFO doing? Changing the strategic direction of the company by leveraging the finances and the numbers uh, of the company. Accounting tells you what your numbers have been. Finance tells you what your numbers are going to be. Okay. So you're the weatherman. You're like, hey, listen, this is where we're going right now. Tornadoes or something. Yeah. Okay. Finance that, weatherman. Yeah. That's, yeah that's, clockwork, that's a great, yeah. Clockwork tells you, I, this is the, the analogy I always use is, is a train. Clockwork tells you if the light at the end of the tunnel is a train or is daylight. <laughs> that's a good one. It's, and it's good to know early, you know? Yeah. yeah. So that's why you got to get a clockwork. You don't want to know too late because, you know, trains take like a mile to stop or something. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's perfect. Both of those were great answers. So, um, when you decided to start Clockwork, did you see a hole in the market? I know we talked a little bit about it before. Yeah. Was there a hole in the market? Did you feel like, okay, this is something that, because it doesn't sound like this was just a financially driven, no, no. one no one says, hey, I'm going to have a, 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 you know, a tech startup you know, for financial reasons. You see a hole or you see a way to service people. Tell me about like what that looked like for you. Yeah, I was... You know, like I said, I started an outsourced CFO firm and I scaled it to eight FTEs. I had, you know, over a hundred clients doing really well, but I was living in Excel. I was living in Mm -hmm. spreadsheets. I was Mm -hmm. building models. Clients were blowing my phone up to ask the simplest questions. You know, how much cash do we have? When are we going to run out? How much cash should we raise? And then one of my most, one of my, one of my favorite questions is build me a model for this. Build me a model. Build me a model. Build me. I'm like, do you understand what goes behind build a model? <laughs> like, do you understand? It's not something I can just whip up out of out of yeah, a it's box. Not a, it's not a quote. Yeah. Right? It's, it's not, not like, like slicing yeah. ham in the cafeteria. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd rather slice ham at a cafeteria than build you a model for for whatever wild idea that you think of. Um, but I was trying to find a solution. You know, I was. It, we're talking back in 2015. And I'm like, all right, we're 2015. There has to be some sort of technology for this. You know, QuickBooks Online is there. Zero is there. Gusto is there. You know, all these, all these other tech startups and tech solutions existed for everything else in the market. Marketing, sales, accounting, uh, product, customer support, all these things except finance. And so I'm like, okay, let me try to find something. And I tried them all. And when I mean I try them all, I know every one of my competitors inside and out, not because of market research, but because I was a user of them. I was a paying user of all my competitors. They were all so difficult to use. And most dangerously, they were inaccurate. They were so inaccurate. I would build a finance. Obviously, I had cash flow forecast for all my clients, and I'd build the cash flow forecast in Excel and do this. And I was like, I'd spend north of 10 hours a month just updating that for them, right? I'd sign up for a solution, and the software will tell me I have nine months of runway. And I'm like, I don't. We have six (laughs) months of runway. 
then I try and look at it and I'm like, how, how dangerous is it for a software to tell someone that they have an extra three months of cash that they simply don't have? And so for me, I, you know, it wasn't, I see a market gap. This could be a huge company that are, it was, I need to solve this for the companies that have no fighting chance. Because when a company goes out of business, who cares? But the people running the company care. The employees yeah. of that company, the 10, 15, 20 people, they should be taken care of. And it's not the sexy market, right? Everyone wants to go, I'm focused on, S on, on VC-backed companies. Okay, you're focused on 1% of 1% of companies in the world. Totally. Go, go after that. Or I'm only focused on companies making over $100 million. Great. You have a target of 2,500 companies making over $100 million that you can go and charge an astronomical amount to. But what about the middle people? What about the smaller people that completely are underserved? Companies that are the lifeblood of the economy that no one gives a shit about because it's not sexy to serve. Yeah, That's what, that's what Clockwork's here for. So now we use Clockwork at Reconciled. So Michael, as you know, as a, you know, as a customer of Fades, you know, can you just, I mean, tell us what you like about Clockwork or what are we using it for? Just as sort of an endorsement for him. Yeah, no, I mean, we, we've been able to standardize our advisory practice around um, leveraging Clockwork's tool and it save and save our team a ton of time on, you know, basically the, the manual redundant work of creating a, a custom model every single time for our clients in Excel or Google Sheets, saving us out of that and allowing our advisors then to standardize around the clockwork tool and focus on actually giving advice, right? That's why yeah. clients ultimately are signing up. They're not signing up because mm -hmm. they want to know uh, how, long did, how long did it take you to build that wonderful model? The clients <laughs> are not, they don't yeah. care, right? They, they, like, they say it as if, you know, their, their assumption is, oh, you, you must be able to just pull this out of your pocket and then put some numbers into it and it gives you a magic information. The reality <laughs> is it takes, it takes a long time and to come up with models that fit every industry or every type of client you're going to work with and to keep it updated. Um, that's all, that's all kind of manual work that has to be done, but it's not valuable. It's not valuable to the client yeah. and it's not valuable to small business owners. What they want is the actual advice, the actual outcome so be able to take a, a tool like that and go, okay, we're going to have a more accurate set of data coming out of here that's better than what most people can build manually in Excel. Mm -hmm. Let's then start and actually focus on giving advice. And that's, that's what it's allowed us to do. Yeah, that is uh, it's super cool. I mean, this has been a, an awesome conversation. I'm learning a ton. Um, so this is just so fascinating to me. So, so you get in, so now you have your idea for clockwork or you're in clockwork. So now you're a startup officially, you're hiring employees. I loved your website. I loved, you know, sort of, the, you can look at their values right on their website, which I think is a great idea for people to know, you know, Hey, listen, I want to know who I'm dealing with. Like the clockwork website will tell you, tell me, you know, how did you come up with a set of values? Is this what you value? Or is this like a, Hey, I read in Forbes that this is so-and-so's <laughs> values, or is this like, hey, this is my startup. These are my values. We're doing it my way, and that's how we'll, we'll do or die. Yeah, so the values, Clockworks values that you see on our website was actually one of the very first things I did right after I incorporated the company. Um, so I actually have a co-founder, and he, you know, he's, he's unfortunately removed or kind of serving as an advisor for the business because he had a he had a, a medical emergency literally a year ago, June of last year. Um, right after we closed our first VC round, $2 million, the team was scaling. He suffered two strokes out of oh. nowhere. And I was, wow. you know, to say I was blindsided was because he was also my best friend or he is my best friend, right? Is he, he a young guy or an older guy? Young, super young guy. He was oh, you know, 30, 33 years old, extremely healthy, worked out regularly, like 10% body fat. I mean, ate very cleanly, um, completely freak situation. And so at literally three months after we raised all this money and we're hiring all these people, 
he he had a medical emergency and, and you know his ha- he's had to step away from the business to focus on his focus on his health but five years ago it was literally me and him in my living room of my condo and we had just incorporated clockwork he was an investment banker um, he didn't come on full time uh, for three years after after you know I started comp- I started clockwork but it was building the values because we were a purpose built company and a value driven company. And I wanted everyone to know what we stood for and who were, who were there for. We've never pivoted our brand, our messaging, what clockwork serves for small businesses and small to medium enterprises are the hero. That's been the voice and the brand and the message and our positioning from day one, you know, five and a half years ago. I don't know many V I don't know many tech companies in general that can say that they are still servicing the same people, the same product, the same company, and have market product fit doing that. Um, we've been we've been fortunate enough because I lived it. I I I lived it for so long in that market. And I knew my values, the values that were necessary for Clockwork to succeed. And it was the values necessary for other team members to know how to join the company, right? I think it's, yeah. I think it's very good. I drive, my, my expectations are through the roof. Not one of my team members will ever tell you that I have low expectations. Every single one of my team members tells me I have too high of expectations, but that's never going to change. And so whenever I hire people, they know the standards are through the roof and they know what to expect when they get here. Right. Assuming positive, positive intent, especially now over the digital age, it's what what you say on a Zoom call over a 30 minute call. You're talking to people. They hang up. They have the rest, the you know, eight and a half other hours of the day to think about what you told them over a 30 minute Zoom call on a screen. If they think anything other than assuming positive intent that it came from a good position, you're, you're going to ruin the culture. You're going to ruin good employees. You're going to ruin good team members. You're going to ruin what you built pretty, pretty damn quickly. Um, so those were really the, the values that I knew were necessary to build the next generation company. Yeah, I think too, Michael, speak on, I, I don't want to make that. I mean, this is all about fading and clockwork, but Reconciled has done a really good job with values as well. And I think when you know what a company values and you're going to work there, you're working with them, you know, like mistakes may happen, but this is sort of a lit, like, or even, you know, my boss has super high, you know, metrics or expectations for me, but these are the values I know if I adhere by, you know, I'll be, I'll be okay. I'm not always going to hit those numbers, but here's values. Can you speak a little bit about reconciled values, Michael, just as far as, you know, what, what you value? I know a lot of them sound very similar. Yeah, I, I want when when we're talking about values, really, it's it's providing clarity for people that you want to attract to come work for you, mm. and allowing them to see what you're about, and so that when they come, they're not surprised, yeah. right? And so one of the things that we do when we have um, uh, somebody interview here is the last interview is usually with me, and and I usually tell them, look, you've just went to two or three interviews. You're you're gonna get an offer. The question is, is that I don't want you surprised that um, you're coming to work for a company that I started. <laughs> and yeah, you're gonna, yeah. you're coming to work for a company whose values mimic the values I have in my life, right? Mm-hmm. And so I'm very transparent and open about that. And and to say, look, I want you to be able to wake up everybody and go, look, I'm excited to go work for this company because I share its values and I'm excited about what the company is about and I'm excited about uh, and I know. Um, how I ought to behave and how I ought to be and the kind of person that it this company wants me to become uh, and you know, not be surprised by that. And so I just people look, it's not for everybody. Right? Working at a, a, a fast growing, a fast paced place uh, that's growing and changing and trying to fulfill a big, big vision. Um, it's not for everybody. If you want a place that's more stable, <laughs> that is safe, where you're going to be doing the same thing over and over again, where you kind of know your defined role, and it's not going to change for several years. Well, this isn't the place. Please don't take the please don't take the offer. Yeah. And my job is really to make sure people really considered um, the values we have at the company, the behaviors we expect, the big vision we're trying to reach, and if they want to be a part of that journey, 
right? That's probably the same thing for you, Fady, is, is you're, it's, it's, it's the issue of making sure they really evaluated, are they going to be all in with you or not? Because there's the fantasy and yeah. what mm-hmm. magazines write about of working at a startup or working at a fast paced growing company who's, whose yeah. intention is growth, yeah. right? Then there's the reality, like yeah. you said, and the reality most of the time is not sexy. It's not fun. Yeah. Sometimes it can cause mental illness and depression. It's yeah. like, yeah. Yeah. that's the reality. And yeah. I, I think most people don't get that when they just read Fast Company or TechCrunch. Yeah. And they, they just see money. They just see the numbers. And they don't realize like, no, that money's not that that money's not for us to just play with. Yeah. 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 To build a business. Yeah. Uh, a, re- a real business. Yeah. I mean, well, and I think, sorry, go ahead, Fadi. You no, know, I was just going to say, you're absolutely spot on with that. And I think one of the, the two points to that one is with your, and you've done a really good job of doing this. This is why I love having these conversations with you. This is why I love being a huge proponent of what you guys are doing, not just because you're a clockwork, you know, partner, because you guys do such good things. And when we met our values aligned, it made it so much easier to work together from the beginning and it's made it so much easier to continue to develop our relationship and i think that's another piece of of values that and that's why they're on our website right because when our partners go to our website and we have a little tagline on our website that says don't be an asshole i was just about to bring that up it's right on there yeah it's it's on the website and i can't tell you how many times that you know every every few months i'll get someone that writes through our website chat you have something offensive on your website, take it down immediately. I'm sure it's a mistake. And then I'm like, and I, I'll put it up on LinkedIn and I'll make a, make a, you know, post about it. But I think, you know, if you're offended by don't be an asshole, don't work with us. Mm. You know, we're not for everyone, but if you are forward thinking and you're innovative and you want to, and you, you value those types of brands and those types of values work with us. But if you, are from an older school, you know, outlook where if things don't go your way, you can scream and cuss and, and, and yell at people. And you think that's going to get you your way. That's not how it works. It's one of the people would say that, that, I mean, they may be offended by the word, but the statement like, Oh, you're offended by that. Yeah. Like, well, <laughs> then, yeah, I definitely don't want you working yeah. for my company if that's sort of your, yeah. your MO. So that is wild. So that's what I was going to bring up. So Check out the website, the values. Each time you roll over it, it will it will tell you what it is. And um, you know, it's it sounds like you guys, I mean, you guys have a lot. I've known Mike a long time, Fady you a lot less. You know, um, I told Michael we had a situation where I just said, Hey man, I'm here to burn the boats with you. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> let's do this, man. I mean, yeah. let's we're Vikings, let's send those boats off, let's cut it off. We don't have a choice. Yeah, you know what, yeah. and we'll be here at the end if if it, if it is what it is, and if it's not, then then we'll have those stories where we, you know, we were ground down to a little nub by the system, but you know, yeah. it was we remember a little more fondly than we should now. Um, is there anything else? I mean, you think the anything else you want to talk about with clockwork, or is there something that I mean, you know you made you made a phenomenal analogy with the band of brothers thing and then right now with the vikings thing as well right and and what's funny is i always tell my my team members so every friday one of the coolest productivity hacks that you know i'll share with you guys and, and share with anyone else right is we have a show and tell and on friday afternoon every single friday afternoon every clockwork team member calls on and you show what you did that week that you're proud of and you explain what it is, how you did it, da, da, da. You share your biggest win for the week, and then you share your biggest lesson learned. That's what our show and tell is. And it's so powerful for team members to know that everyone else has their back because mm-hmm. I explained to my team, we are it, we are at war. Like this is a wartime, like this is wartime building, right? When you're series C, series D you've raised $250 million and you guys are, you know, 500 employees. Yeah. You're probably not at war. You know, you're, you're just running a company, but when you're, when you're sub 25 employees, you're sub 50 employees, every day is a battle. Like you have to battle, you have to fight, you have to push things through. You have to be uncomfortable. You have to do things you don't want to do. 
uh, because you know you literally are at war. I mean, you're you're building you're building you're at war for your customers. You're at war for your other team members. You're you're you know you're afraid to step one one too much here, one too much there. So you know, I I absolutely I think that analogy is is spot on. Obviously, you know, with all due respect to everyone that's actually been to war and and everything there, of course. But yeah, um, you know, building a business is not for the for the meek yeah that's a well tell us tell us about the vc fund that you raised from and kind of that yeah what um what why did you decide to go with them yeah underscore vc they're out of boston by far the most genuine vc that i've ever met i mean they are so genuine from the very beginning of the conversations and i spoke to probably a 120 VCs before I raised $2 million. Like Whoa. we're talking $2 million, you know, granted it's still $2 million, but like in the grand scheme of things, we're talking $2 million. Yeah. Um, and every single other VC that I spoke to, they always wanted to know what was in it for them. How am I going to take advantage of this? How am I going to get the best terms of this deal? How, how am I going to get as much out of you as possible and then they were full of shit with their conversations, right? Hey, I'll follow up with you by the end of this week. Three weeks goes by. Hey, sorry, I got mixed up with things. We're actually going to pass. It's like, why do what you yeah. say? I don't care that you're passing. Just do what you say. Mm. Be who you be who you're who you say you are. And the second that I met with with Brian Devaney, he was the he was now he's he's you know moved up significantly in the firm just over the last year and a half, but he was the senior associate that we first met. And he goes, I will follow up with you by the end of this week. I absolutely love this. Can you make this, this, that send me, you know, these four things. I sent him those four things responded right away. Then next steps were set before the end of that week. Mm -hmm. Then the partner joined the partner, the founding partner was John Pierce, but not only helpful, um, got on the call, no bullshit, right? This is what I like about your business. This is what I need to learn more of. Great. Let's have this next conversation. And it, it was so transparent. And then when it came down to the terms of the deal, it was it, over a conversation. It wasn't any mm-hmm. drama of, well, mm-hmm. we're going to send you a term sheet. We're not going to tell you it until we send you the term sheet. And then we're going to go back and forth between what? No, it was literally on a Zoom call. Hey, are you good with this? Yeah, I'm good with that. Okay, sounds good. And, and then the deal was done, right? It was, they got it. And that was a key is you need to find investors that get it. If your investors don't get it, um, like all the investors that I spoke, so many in the early days, they're like, you can't automate this. Um, I've built models before. There's no way you can build a software to do that. I've built blah, 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 the whole, and I'm like, great. Then you're not my person. You're not the person that understands what I'm doing with this company. The second that I met with the underscore team, they're like, holy shit. Yes, this, we've been looking for something like this. This actually hits all the marks. You guys have built such a unique product because implementation is zero, right? That's always been the biggest hurdle in any competitor, all the competitors that we have. And that's our secret sauce is go create an account right now. It's custom. It's built intelligently right out of the box because we are pulling data unlike anyone else in this in this space. And the VC understood it. And the second that we met, I mean, it was like, this is, this is, this is it. And then, yeah, it's been great working with them. And that And it's funny because, you know, sales, insurance, I mean, whatever, the people are like, well, I'll spare his feelings. I won't say no, no, spare my time and tell me up front. I, <laughs> don't worry about my feelings. Oh, yeah. Don't make me follow up with you every yeah. other day for the next two weeks. Like you're not going to hurt my feelings. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah. I understand what you're doing too. So yeah. Um, for sure. Well, so let, let's step outside of clockwork for just a minute or two. Um, where, where, I mean, we can find you. I know you got a Twitter, we can find you on clockwork, LinkedIn. Um, where can we find you? LinkedIn, LinkedIn. I'm, I'm probably most active on LinkedIn and Instagram. Um, and you know, the podcast, the real slim fady show on, on Instagram on Spotify, on Apple, you know, Apple, uh, Apple music. Yeah. Apple podcasts. What are they? Apple's always got to be different. <laughs> um, 
yeah so on on all the on all the major podcast streaming and i mean literally just email me i you know as, as you know michael's the same way i think one of the best one of the one of the ways that we absolutely clicked i mean you can literally contact me via email and i'm, I'm happy to jump on a call within short order right it, I'm, it's not one of those oh i'll get back to you in four weeks and then i'll tell you that i can't meet for another four weeks um email me i mean my email is you know Katie at clockwork.ai, super simple. And um, yeah, I'd love to love to chat with anyone. Well, before we let you go, are you an Android guy or are you an Apple guy? iPhone. I can't, I cannot oh. talk, I can't hire people. If, if I text them and it shows up text message, I, I, I will mm-hmm. only communicate them with them uh, via Slack. And I can never, ever be friends with someone who does not uh, text blue. Well, two of two CEOs agree on this podcast. <laughs> Apple is the way to go. And then just really quickly, um, give us one passion about like that you love outside of clockwork. And then if anyone's in Chicago and you're a restaurant guy, where should they go to eat? Uh, so my passion is fishing. I go love on. fishing. And catch and release. I, I, you know, I don't, I don't kill the fish that I that I catch. It's a, it's a phenomenal sport that I love. Um, without fishing, I would go absolutely insane. I, I love fishing. It's my way to get out, and it's my my biggest outlet. And the best restaurant in Chicago is Bavette's. Uh, Bavette's oh, Steakhouse. Uh, it is the best steak and seafood with the best bread. If you like bread, they bring you bread at the beginning of that. Oh my gosh, it is. Why does bread have to be bad for you? Bread is so like good bread is like good bread and yeah. butter is like, oh man, bread and butter. Yeah. Now you got to go to Bavette's if you want good bread and butter. I mean, that that is literally the best restaurant in Chicago. From a restaurant, from a former restaurant tour, yeah. you your prime rib at the age of eight, Bavette's, <laughs> Chicago, Fady. Um, this has been awesome. This has been yeah. fun. Uh, it's been enlightening. I think that um you know i try to tell people listen to this not because it's not super geeky where you're not going to understand but i think these long form conversations need to happen around business because like you said if you're reading like michael said if you're reading in wired it's like well here's our highlights yeah but when you walk it when you watch a documentary you see it all mm-hmm. and sort of like that's what i think is important that people realize is you know faded and walk in you know with the monocle and spats on like the monopoly man <laughs> and was like, I'm starting clockwork. You know, this was a, was a battle. So thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. We really appreciate it. Um, check out his podcast, check out reconciled. Fady would agree. Um, <laughs> if you have any questions, you can email me. I'm Jay Cates at reconciled.com or Michael. You can get in touch with him or on Twitter. Um, he's on Twitter. He's on a bunch of different platforms, but um, yeah, that was the live show for yeah. today. If you want to be a guest and you're you think you got something worthwhile, send me an email. Look for me on Twitter. Send it, and we'll get we'll uh, we'll we'll vet you properly to make sure you're as good as Fady. But Fady, <laughs> thank you very much. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Oh, thank you guys. Thank you, guys you so awesome. much. Yeah, thanks.